Last time, we went through a story starring an obviously evil character in a fantasy setting. But now we're moving from the fantastical to the surreal, and from obviously evil to ambiguously evil. Off was a game I played more recently, about two years ago. As someone who was more used to playing games that were straightforward with heroes and villains, this came across as a bit of a shock. And yet I found it in me to press forward and beat the game, despite a few things about it that annoyed me, mostly the off and out there puzzles. Like before, I went back to this game to see if it holds up. And also like before, now might be a good time to talk about its background. Well, what little of it I could find anyway. Once upon a time, a person by the name of Mortis Ghost got together with his team on Productive Fun Time. Using RPG Maker 2003, they made the French RPG called Off, which saw release in 2008. In 2011, the reconstructed game team released an English translation for it. As of this recording, it's on version 2. It became critically acclaimed, praised for its story, setting, and characters. And in 2013, it became the sixth most reblogged game on Tumblr. Here's the list. Now look at the other titles on that list. Damn, that's impressive. Curiously, its tagline is, A nice game for cute children. We'll see about that. But before I go on, I'm gonna warn you. There are spoilers abound in this review, and for a game like this, you might be better off playing it before watching someone talk about it. If you already have, or simply don't care, then we'll continue. Are we good? Okay. You begin this story with a disembodied voice telling you that the main character, the batter, has an important mission, and that you must make sure he doesn't fail it. You're dropped off in Zone Zero, where you meet the judge, optionally do a combat tutorial, and solve a few puzzles based on writings on the wall. Get used to them. There are plenty of puzzles in this game, and not all of them are the same as this. Once you're done, you head for Zone 1, an area composed of several towns that harvest certain elements. Smoke, metal, plastic, and meat. It's here where you first encounter the Spectres, creatures of various shapes and sizes that act as the primary enemies you'll fight. You also find an add-on, simply named Alpha. Throughout Zone 1, you clear the areas of the ghosts, and once you're done, you get to face the foul-mouthed guardian, Daedon. You defeat him, purify the zone, and move on to the next one. Before you do, though, you're treated to a cutscene featuring a child sitting in a red room. Zone 2, however, is where things start to change. In addition to finding another add-on, you learn a bit more about the world you're in from the library's books. The Guardian here, Jaffet, has gone insane thanks to the neuroses of the Elsins and wreaks havoc on them as a result. You end up killing him and, by extension, Valerie, the judge's brother who was possessed by the Mad Guardian. Then again, he probably died the moment Jaffet showed his true form. At least, I hope he did. Then you get to Zone 3, where the Elsons are oddly calm about everything, and they think the Spectres are nice. They are quickly proven wrong. You get through the first area just fine, but then you get to the treatment rooms. The Elsons there mumble about getting something if they work hard enough, and once you get through the puzzle, you find them killing specters over... sugar. As it turns out, sugar is an artificial element created in this zone, and it has addictive properties. It's also made from the corpses of other Elsons. No wonder the director keeps telling them the specters are nice. It's here that elements of horror start popping up, particularly in the final area of Zone 3, where you not only kill a burnt Elson that does nothing but cry for help, but you also fight... this. WHY WON'T THIS THING DIE?! THERE ARE HEADS COMING OUT OF ITS MOUTH! And then you fight the Guardian, Anok, and guess what? The horror doesn't end, not even in his death. His bloody, decapitated head gives one hell of a line, assuming you haven't learned of this by now. Without its guardian, a zone will fade into the nothingness. Sure enough, if you return to any of the purified zones, almost every trace of life is gone. Almost being the key word. Within these zones are monsters called secretaries, diabolical... Sorry, demoniacal spirits that are very dangerous to encounter, especially at low levels. If you ever want to return to a zone after you purify it, just trust me. Wait. Once Anok is dead, the final area of the game is available to you. The room. 
You go through it in chapters, starting with chapter 5 and ending with chapter 0. This entire area is a mind screw sequence with a hallway that resembles a children's drawing book, Shadow and Giant Elsons, and a flashback featuring the Guardians. You learn that the entire game takes place after the world ended, the three Guardians used to be decent people, the add-ons are somehow connected to them, and an unknown figure, possibly the child, hates being in this place. Eventually, you reach the final stage, complete with Zachary warning you that you might want to save. You might also notice a strange item in his possession, the Grand Brachial. This is one of the Grand Element items, three of which you can get at the end of the Purified Zones, and one you can get by killing a bonus boss in Zone Zero named Sugar. If you have all five in your possession and talk to Zachary back in Zone Zero, you can get one of two items, the Ashley Bat or the Ares card. The Ashley Bat allows you to hit twice when attacking, while the Ares card unlocks a secret ending. When you're good and ready, you head up to encounter the Queen, and after you two banter back and forth, it's final boss time. Or not. You see, Vader Aloha here isn't the final boss. This is only chapter one. When you defeat her, you enter a red version of the room where... No, I don't want to kill a child! Don't make me kill the baby! Don't make me kill him! No matter what you do, you can't escape. You have no choice but to kill the infant Hugo. And when you do, the zone becomes pure. You head on through a corridor towards a switch where... Oh, thank the queen you're here, judge! Yes, the judge appears at the last moment to stop the batter, but not before he calls you out. And I do mean you. Once they're done talking, you're offered a final chance at redemption. Either continue with the batter's quest or switch to the judge's side. Either way, it's final boss time. The battles aren't difficult in the slightest. As the batter, all you have to do is spam your strongest moves until the judge falls. As the judge, spam the ever-loving crap out of aneurysm rupture. It deals a lot of damage. Interestingly, if you join the judge's side, the batter looks less human and more like a huge, frightening ducky. Regardless, the game ends in one of two ways. If you sided with the batter, he kills the judge and flips the switch, effectively ending the world. If you sided with the judge, then the batter dies and the cat wanders the purified zones during the credits. But wait, there's still the Ares card! If you have that in your possession, you get a super secret ending where, in a different universe, space monkeys take over the empty world and create robot factories so they can fight the flying brains. So remember, this was all your fault. Given that this is an RPG Maker game, it's obviously not going to have fancy 3D graphics. Admittedly, I've played very few 2D RPG games outside of the Pokémon series, though from what I've seen, the 2D plane is capable of producing pretty imagery. While the graphics of Off aren't necessarily pretty, they are most certainly weird. The characters lack color, except for the blood that comes out of them when they're hurt or dying. Meanwhile, the overworld of each area is composed of various shades of one color. It's simple, but I like it. It reminds me a little bit of the Gen 1 Pokémon games, particularly yellow because the color of the area changed depending on on where you were. Then there's what happens to all of the color when you purify the zone. Everything looks lifeless, which ties into the mostly empty feeling you get when you're in one of these places. It definitely gives off a disturbing vibe the first time you enter one, and it makes you question the batter's mission. This was done really well, which is great because the last time I saw a similar gimmick, it was done rather poorly. I should give a bit of a warning, though. If you're like me and have a bit of an aversion to bright or saturated colors, you might want to take care when playing this on full screen. While I kept the game in windowed mode to make sure it was recording, when I was taking notes, I felt my eyes ache during certain moments, mainly the purified maze in Zone 2, and a knock bursting out of the ground to stop your escape. As for the enemies, they generally look creepy. Most of them look a bit demonic in some way. Even the bedsheet-looking specters have a few moments. And then there's the burnts. Almost all of them are depicted with a black ooze flying out where their heads were, which gives off the implication that their head exploded from stress. 
The two exceptions are the critic and pastel burns, but they don't need to lose their heads to freak you out. Their appearances alone will likely trigger some kind of response from you. And if not, their battles definitely will. But the worst of them all has to be the secretaries. They look like creepy little dolls. One of them looks like they're melting. Even one of the main characters looks creepy. The judge looks outright vicious with his teeth, yet he's one of the good guys. A good guy with a decent vocabulary, no less. Everyone else looks decent to me. The Elsons give off a bit of an innocent vibe, well at first. The bosses look cool, especially Daydon, even if he is the world's biggest jackass. And Zachary? He's alright. I like his masks, particularly the cat one, but that's more due to symbolism than anything. So overall, the game looks good. The backgrounds and overworlds are simple yet effective, and the enemies and characters have interesting, if sometimes creepy designs. Just be a bit wary of your eyes hurt due to bright colors. Since there's no voice acting, aside from the noises everyone makes when talking, most of the score is riding on the soundtrack. And let me tell you, this soundtrack is brilliant. The tracks add atmosphere to the area you're in. Some areas have more of a relaxed vibe, others a more ominous feeling. Sometimes the audio clashes with the setting to create an unsettling effect. The Smoke Mines, the place where you first encounter the specters, has Soft Breeze playing, a track that's one of the more relaxing pieces. One track you're going to be familiar with quickly is called Pepper Steak, mostly because it's the main battle theme. It's a catchy piece that seems out of place in comparison to the rest of the soundtrack, but it makes the fights more enjoyable, which makes its absence in a certain area of Zone 3 more jarring. <laughs> I'm in Silent Hill, SEND HELP! And if you thought the purified zones couldn't get worse, the track not safe proceeds to wreck your day. You get to hear what sounds like someone crying for help while banging on a door, whispers that seem to make no sense, though I swear one of them said it was good that you killed me, and the main tune is ominous as all hell, with drones, distorted gusts, and what I think are bells being played in a discordant way. And like that one area of Zone 3, Pepper Steak doesn't play during battles. Just this. This track takes the atmosphere of the purified zones to pure nightmare fuel territory. Though I suppose I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the last song you're likely to hear in the game. Emphasis on talk about because if I actually play it, this video will likely get wrecked by copyright. The credit song is over the rainbow from The Wizard of Oz. Considering what happens prior to this, the track ends up going from one of the biggest I Want songs in existence to one hell of a solemn track. Especially if you sided with the judge. Judge, I'm so sorry. One thing to note though is that the tracks don't loop properly, they just stop and start again. According to the readme file, this was due to RPG Maker being a pain, so I'm not going to knock the score down for that. While I'm here, I may as well talk about the sound effects. They help add to the atmosphere and the characters. Zachary's laughter, for instance, gives you the impression that he's a jokey kind of guy. And given that he's Mr. Fourth Wall Breaking Incarnate, that makes sense. There's also the Elsons wheezing, which again makes sense because they're breathing in the smoke. The pitch is also important. At a normal pitch, they're relatively calm, but if the pitch is higher or lower than usual, tread with caution. They're likely about to become burnt. All in all, the soundtrack is brilliant, and it, along with the sound effects, add to the atmosphere. Well done, Mr. Coldwood. Well done. This game plays like a standard RPG. You walk around the overworld, talk to people to get more information, and deal with random encounters, which often appear at the worst of times. Combat is simple. You attack until the enemies die. You can either use a normal attack or use a special move called a competence, which uses up CP, but can do a variety of things, from dealing more damage than a regular attack, to healing your allies HP, to debuffing your enemies, etc. Items also vary in their effects, though most of them heal you in some way. I didn't have to use them often, except in Purified Zone 3, but trust me, if you think you need to heal, then heal. Otherwise, you might do something stupid like I did and end up dying. Lastly, you can flee, but only the batter has this option. Some of the enemies have weaknesses and resistances to the four elements. 
including the secretaries who are weak to plastic and resist smoke. But honestly, I hardly used the elemental attacks, mostly because they didn't do a whole lot of damage to begin with. Granted, I gave the plastic attack a chance because I was fighting the secretaries, but then I found out that Special Home Run did more damage. And of course, there's the puzzles. Oh dear god, there are a lot of puzzles. A good chunk of them are the cube puzzles, where you press them in the order you're given to move forward. Some are obvious, others not so much. But they're not the only puzzles either. There's book puzzles, switch puzzles, one involving a stamped note, another involving a rock. I could go on and on, but then I'd be here all day. Personally, I don't care too much for puzzles, but most of them are simple enough. Emphasis on most. See, a certain puzzle drove me up the wall. The game controller puzzle in Zone 3. It involves pushing a table to another room to read a set of names arranged like a directional pad, then finding the controller to open the door to Anox's lair. One problem, you need a code. To figure out where this code is, you have to fight and defeat the pastel burnt to get a music box, then hand it to Zachary, who then tells you to go read the readme file. Excuse me. <clears throat> right. Moving on to controls. You move around using the arrow keys, interact with Z, and access the menu by hitting escape. They're relatively simple, but I notice that the movement controls take a bit to get used to. The batter moves rather quickly, so instead of going up a ladder, you might hit a wall. Thankfully, you'll get used to his movement speed rather quickly, so expect this to only happen during the beginning of the game. As for glitches, I only came across what might be a graphical bug or a limitation of RPG Maker. When Anok chases after you, you can see that his body is split in two. This is probably due to both halves being animated during this segment. But other than that, I didn't come across anything bad or even game-breaking. Overall, the gameplay is rather average. Nothing different is being done to the standard RPG formula. At least the controls are smooth, if a bit hard to get used to at first. Despite their monochrome appearance, the cast of Bop is rather colorful. We get to know them, but some facts are left up to interpretation. Now, last time I got a bit annoyed at Overlord's cast because we hardly get to know anything about them. Here, though, we know just enough to be able to make interpretations that make sense, ones that we feel confident in making. And I'll start off with the most ambiguous of the bunch, the Batter. He starts off as a stoic character, determined to get his task done at any cost. He shows some degree of kindness and tolerates the Judge, Zachary, and the Elsons until they become burnt, but that's about it. He pretty much remains the same throughout the story. Even after all the atrocities he's committed, he's still calm and hardly shows any emotion. Hell, he even says that the purified zones are better than they were before. Really? You'd rather have the freaky music, bleak landscape, and demonic ghosts? You have one warped mind, Batter. Or rather, in my opinion, a warped morality. There's a trope called black and white insanity, which involves characters who have an extremely hard time understanding moral ambiguity. To me, the better comes across as someone who doesn't understand the concept of gray, only black and white. Anyone he sees as having black morality needs to be destroyed. For example, when Daedon leaves after chewing out on Elson, the batter says that he must destroy him because he was being hostile. Much later, after he kills Hugo, he says, From now on, there will be no more darkness. I think he was created with a simple morality in mind, but wound up taking it too far. His mind couldn't comprehend why beings who he thought were pure were doing horrible things, and in the end, he snapped, leading him to his quest to wipe out the impure. Which, in this case, meant anyone and anything associated with the Queen. It didn't matter if they did good things in the past. What mattered was that they were in the way of his quest and needed to be put down. But what about the one who controlled him throughout this quest? What about you? Yes, you are technically a character in this game. You were the one who had him help people, sure. But you were also the one who led him to the bosses, who helped kill them, who made all the zones pure. You only have two chances of redemption. Either side with the judge at the end of the game, or do what the game over music implies and let the batter stay in his coma. In other words, stop playing the game before you help him destroy the world further. If you do neither, you end up proving the batter's point. Escaping from your purpose is impossible. Now you have to finish the job. 
and you're going to feel awful afterward because everything that happened was truly your fault. Let's move on to the judge, the cat-like guardian of Zone Zero. He begins as a teacher, going to the other zones to help get you where you're supposed to go and probably to just look around. However, after his brother is killed, the judge is noticeably traumatized. When you go back to Zone 2, you see him at the top of the library, meowing forlornly and asking if you've seen his brother. The next time you see him is after he realizes that what you've been doing is horrible and attempts to stop you, even if he believes he won't be able to. He's gone through hell, but he's gonna try to save what's left of his world anyway. If you end up siding with him, his last line is, Hence nothing remains except for our regrets. There's an obvious implication that he regrets helping the batter, and who can blame him? He goes from a guardian who's willing to help the batter on his quest, to one who laments not realizing the truth behind it, and ends up paying for it. Then there's Zachary, everyone's favorite merchant. He's got this jokester personality, and he loves making a ton of meta jokes. When he takes the judge's place in Zone 3, he pokes fun at the cat's tendencies, such as using large words and him being a mentor character. However, this isn't his only trait. In Zone 2, we find out that he runs the theme park, implying that he's trying to get the Elsons to break free of their fears. When he takes over for the judge in Zone 3, he wears a cat mask, possibly out of respect for him, his brother, or both of them. Then, should you go after Sugar and kill her, he appears to be upset. Given that she told you to say goodbye to Zachary for her, chances are pretty good that the two were friends. Which might mean Sugar knew the judge and Valerie as well. Things just keep getting worse. Finally, there's his last line of dialogue. Bis vincit qui se vincit in Victoria. I'm sorry if I butchered that. It's a Latin phrase that, when translated, roughly means, he who defeats himself in victory is twice victorious. Considering that he breaks the fourth wall often, I wouldn't be surprised if this was his attempt to give you a hint on the ending. I assume that there isn't much he can do. Since he seems to be aware that he's in a video game, it's likely he knows that he must abide by its script. He isn't scripted to fight the batter, so he must comply, no matter how much he may not want to. Now for the other Guardians. Daydon is an asshat, no questions asked, but we find out in the room that he wasn't always like this. Sure, the book in Zone 2 stated he was full of anger, and it shows here, but he's also shown to have a soft side when he has Hugo, I think, wipe his tears with his coat. He talks to him about how great the world he and the other Guardians create will be, and even asks if he's ever ridden a Padalo before. No wonder there were so many Padalo points near his stronghold. He wanted Hugo to ride on one. We get a lot of backstory on Chaffin. He was once a kind and generous ruler, sitting atop the library and watching the Elsons. However, as they became fearful and didn't appreciate what he'd done for them, he grew more upset until he lost his mind and turned on them. He tries getting them killed several times, and by the time you fight him, he's well aware that what he's done was evil, and that killing him is justified. And in the room, you give him a book about flowers. Guess what you can find in the library? Anok, according to the book, is cold yet fair. Well, given that everyone in his zone has a job, that line's certainly accurate. He's shown to have a bit of a theatrical flair in his words, even when he's royally pissed off at you. Like Daydon, the room shows him having a softer side, stating that he'll bake you cakes if you help him out, and he never breaks his promises. Well, he didn't quite bake cakes, but he did make sugar. God, I feel bad about them now. We don't find out much about the Queen or Hugo, as their stories are laid out in the room. Hugo was presumably stuck in the room while his mother was away, and his father gave him medicine and comics, neither of which he liked. He became friends with the three Guardians, and eventually wanted to go outside and play. His mother came for him, which is good, because it sounds like his dad's a bit of a crappy person if Hugo hated him. And then we see the Queen and the Batter bicker, and we find out that they're connected to Hugo. Due to a mistranslation in the English version, the Queen says that Hugo's their son. In the original French, however, it's revealed that Hugo created them. Which makes sense, it was foreshadowed a couple of times that the batter's not exactly human, but it raises a lot of questions on how good they were with Hugo. Seeing as it's likely they were created to be his parents, and the Queen's dialogue as she's dying implies that they were like husband and wife before the batter went off the deep end. After everything these characters go through, I want to give them all hugs. Except the batter, he's kind of a monster. They've been through so much crap and wound up coming out of it worse than they were before, especially Jaffet, who only wanted some respect out of the neurotic as hell Elsons. Ungrateful little! Overall, the cast is wonderful. 
While parts of their stories are ambiguous, you know just enough to be able to put the pieces together yourself or even come up with theories of your own. All of them have likable traits to the point where you're likely going to feel bad for most, if not all of them by the end. The fact that you yourself can be considered a character is a plus as well. The story is rather weird. You get hit with surreal moments right away, what with, well, pretty much everything. But as you progress, things get complicated. You start finding out more about the backstory and characters in Zone 2, but at the very end is when the story starts injecting elements of other genres into itself, beginning with tragedy with the death of Valerie and the impact it has on the Judge. Come Zone 3 and you're right back into weird territory, as you see the Elsons acting rather calm in comparison to the other Elsons you've met. But once you find out the truth about sugar, horror elements begin to pop up. By the end, Zone 3 is just a large pool of terrors, and the purified zones, like I said earlier, have so many elements in it that just make it full of nightmare fuel. The tragedy elements return once you get to the room, where you learn more about the world, the Guardians, the Queen, and Hugo. By the end, not only are they all dead, most of the world has been purified, if not flat out erased. The story doesn't end well for anyone in this game. The surreal tragedy and horror elements manage to work together to create a unique experience. You'll be confused, afraid, and upset, sometimes all at once. But that's what I think makes the story great. The fact that these three genres were mixed together so well. Everything that happens in the game makes sense for the genres involved. There's also quite a bit of symbolism. For example, the queen has a chess motif. What colors are the typical chess pieces? Black and white. She's pretty much the opposite of the batter, to the point where she even has her own add-ons that look far more regal than her opponents. Then there's quite a few biblical references. The classes of the batter and his add-ons are Savior, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three of the items are named after beings from the Bible. And the queen's name, Vader Eloha, translates out to Father God. There's allusions to things that happen in real life, such as the Elsons mentioning how they shouldn't get attached to the cows, or how they need to keep an eye on their nutrition to get high-grade metal, and how sugar is pretty much a drug in this universe complete with unfortunate withdrawals. Again, I could go on, but I'd be here all day. And then there's the foreshadowing. A lot of it, in fact. There are two moments that stick out to me. The first happens when you've successfully escaped from Enoch. The next room you enter is completely devoid of color, and the familiar track for the Purified Zones plays in place of the regular tune. Granted, you're likely to know what happens when you purify a zone by this point, but if you didn't, this may come as a bit of a shock. After all, there's that implication that just by damaging Enoch, you've killed a part of the zone. The other comes from the Zone 2 library, where you find an untitled book with one sentence. I am running out of oxygen. It makes no sense at first, but then you get to the end of the game. That sentence might have been someone's last words as the world ended. Now, despite the weirdness of it all, the plot does proceed in a coherent fashion. There's the ease of learning about the mechanics in Zone Zero, the build-up to the confrontation with the Queen while dealing with the other Guardians, the climactic battle with her, and the fall of the world as both Hugo and either the Judge or the Batter are killed. The aftermath of the final battle serves as the resolution. Everything is resolved, and we are left with only our regrets. Overall, the story has a great mix of genres, with plenty of foreshadowing and symbolism thrown in, and the plot moves along smoothly despite the oddities surrounding it. How long it'll take to beat this game depends on a few things, namely how good you are with puzzles and RPGs in general. For me, it took about five and a half hours, but that's hardly fair. I still had a good idea about how to do most of the puzzles from when I played it two years ago. If I had to guess, it'll take around six hours if you're experienced, up to seven or eight otherwise. Difficulty is on the easy side. As long as you defeat the enemies and get stronger, keep an eye on your HP and CP, and maybe grind a level before a boss fight, you shouldn't have a problem getting through the zones. Just wait a bit before returning to a purified zone, because the secretaries really do hit hard. Fighting three of them at once might be the worst thing to deal with in this game. Returning to this game is quite fun, especially when I looked through it and noticed a lot of things I missed two years ago. 
The atmosphere was still freaky, and some of the enemies and the music often made my experience a bit of a creepy one. Granted, the gameplay was nothing special, but the colorful cast and story more than make up for it. Play this game when you have the time, I highly recommend it. Are there any games that don't have merchants? Hmm. Wait, Resident Evil didn't have one? Ha! Take that, Zack! 